So I wanted to make a video today uh, talking about tour and services and specifically the web design of these websites and why they're built the way they are. Because I think it illustrates a greater point about making and designing things in general, especially when you have limited resources or capacity to do so. So if you don't know what a tour and service is, it's basically a website that you can access that exists within the tour network without you knowing the website's IP address or the website knowing your IP address. I'm not going to go into like full technical detail about how everything works, but essentially it's just a way to connect to websites and utilize uh, services over the internet in an anonymous way, right? When you connect to a hidden service, the first thing you have to find out is the hidden service's onion address. Now this isn't like a URL or anything that uses DNS. A hidden service's onion address is essentially just a giant string of random uh, characters, letters, and numbers, which is uh, actually that hidden service's public key, which is the key that your Tor client uses to verify at a Tor directory that this hidden service is who it says it is and where it can be found within the Tor network. So because of that, you think there would be no way to have like a cool domain name or any custom URLs like you have in the ClearNet. But what a lot of people will do is that they'll use software to keep generating public keys until it generates a public key with some beginning combination of letters and numbers that they want. So like there was like, a, I think it was like Abacus Market that recently went down, but its onion address had Abacus. It began, this no, it's public key, it's onion address began with um, the word Abacus, which is something that they had to generate over and over again until they got the one that they liked, which is another reason why the few custom, I guess, uh, onion addresses you do see will only have short phrases or words at the beginning and not like the entire thing is one giant, like, you know, custom domain name since it obviously costs a lot of computing power to generate public keys over and over again and check if they match your description. But uh, anyways, after you do connect to a hidden service, the first thing that you're going to be greeted with is a static web page, right? And this is the thing about hidden services is that most people using the Tor browser will have the safest options enabled, obviously, meaning that JavaScript is going to be disabled. So pretty much no hidden service uses JavaScript or relies on JavaScript whatsoever since most people are going to have it disabled, right? Even some websites will only have one small JavaScript program that just displays text that tells a user, hey, you have JavaScript on, you should probably turn this off, right? And this already presents like a few interesting design challenges when it comes to web development since it's sort of every, every web, every hidden service is essentially like a, a web 1.0 website, right? Where um, everything concerning UI is done purely in HTML and CSS and everything concerning actual website functionality has to be done within the back end. Another design challenge is just the way that hidden services have to communicate with the user, right? So how it works is that both the user and the hidden service have to build their own Tor circuits to meet at a single rendezvous point where the user's Tor circuit will transfer information to uh, the hidden services Tor circuit and vice versa, right? And you know, this means that all the traffic that's uh, being transported between the user and the service has to be routed through six different people's computers which means that you know traditionally if you want to connect to a website over the clearnet you make a request you know to that IP address which means you have to travel across your your own ISP's network to like the company's data center somewhere right but in the case of connecting to a hidden service not only do you have to do that exact same thing tra you know traverse your ISP's network to eventually reach the service you want to reach over the internet you also have to traverse the networks of six random volunteers all over the world with varying different uh layer one connections with varying different bandwidths and, and uh computing speeds of different computers for all the different uh, networking and cryptographic stuff that tor does so you know essentially you know just to oversimplify things 
hidden services are extremely, extremely slow because you're basically going through like six or seven proxies depending on if you're using like a snowflake or a bridge or whatnot, right? So from a design aspect, server requests or anything that has to go across, you know, any type of network is going to be very, very expensive. You know, you don't have the luxury of loading up some giant JavaScript blob that does everything within the browser. But you also don't have the luxury of having quick and easy communication with uh, relatively lightweight web pages between the user and the service, right? Meaning hidden services have to be both very, very efficient and do the bare minimum when it comes to uh, actual website functionality. But also, you know, since they're, the whole point is to be anonymous, also maintain not only the anonymity and security of the user, but also the service itself, right? Uh, from my experience, there are generally two camps of hidden services, like two kinds of hidden services you'll see most commonly. The first one being blogs or informational pages, mostly by cybersecurity researchers, just on things related to cybersecurity or Tor or privacy online, things like that. And the second camp being obviously like the marketplaces or anything that's adjacent to that sort of space, like things like Dread, for example. It's not inherently illegal or there's nothing really bad going on there, but people are talking about like, hey, how do I configure Monero correctly so I don't, you know, end up making a mistake and get caught, right? And um, another challenge that these websites, especially in like Camp 2 face specifically, is DDoS attacks which uh, doesn't only affect a lot of these hidden services, but also affects the Tor network as a whole, since it has struggled with DDoS attacks over its lifespan by quite a lot, right? And you know, this obviously means that redundancy is also a big thing when it comes to designing a hidden service. Um, there's, you see that a lot of hidden services have mirrors of each other. So even if there's like, a, even on like different networks, so if there's a hidden service that's under threat of DDoS, not only will it have multiple mirrors on the Tor network, but also probably have mirrors on I2P, right? And it's also not uncommon to be treated with uh, DDoS captchas, uh the first time you visit a website, or like a waiting list or something. And once again, these websites don't have any JavaScript, so all of this has to be done within the back end. I'm pretty sure they use like some uh, Nginx software for that uh, captcha stuff. Another thing that's sort of related to DDoS, but also just sort of related to keeping the communication between the server and its clients as efficient as possible is that the vast majority of website functionality or the entire website itself is going to be locked behind in a user account meaning that if you don't register for an account with the website then you can't actually use or browse a website whatsoever which uh, is, is mainly just like a marketplace thing like on blogs or like informational pages you won't really see this type of stuff but the way they handle accounts on marketplaces is you know, the exact same or similar to how they treated accounts on Web 1.0 pages. Um, user accounts rarely required an email. Most of the time it's just one username and one password. And uh, these accounts will often be locked after a certain number of days of inactivity. Obviously because of the legal risks of, of when it comes to running a service like this and you don't want accounts to be compromised by law enforcement, right? And when you first register for an account, you'll often be given a list of secret words or like just a bunch of random words that can be used to recover your account if you ever lose it or forget the password. It's uh, pretty much the only way of account recovery or anything related to that since you don't want to be associating emails or anything external with stuff that happens uh, within that website, right? Neither you as a user or you as the person running the website wants that to happen. The designers and users of Tor hidden services are obviously very concerned about their security, either because they have to or because they are you know, just generally into cybersecurity and internet privacy and things like that. So there's this whole different mode of operation when it comes to making accounts, when it comes to performing actions on the website or communication with people. You know, when you want to communicate with somebody, you don't just trust the hidden service to keep your communication secret because, you know, you, you can't trust anybody really to keep anything secret or keep anything secure. So a lot of people will only communicate for private communication. They'll only use their own key pair, their own PGP key pairs. And a lot of websites will even integrate this functionality within the website so people can list their public keys on their own profile of their own account in case anybody wants to try to contact them. 
And uh, because of the threat model and the limited bandwidth these websites have available to them, they're designed to be as lightweight, efficient, and as secure as possible. Which, um, you know, a lot of modern web developers have seemed to just completely forgotten about. <clears throat> and it's uh, interesting to see, because you see this in other things too, like music or film production, or obviously other parts of like the software world, or, you know, engineering or design in general. Is that, um, generally speaking, people tend to come up with more creative solutions to problems, and overall, like, better solutions to problems when they're limited in resources, right? Whether that's in the amount of time they have or the money they have, or more specifically, like if you're designing a software application, the amount of uh, RAM you expect to have available to the machine that the software is gonna be running on, or the processor speed and things like that. It's, it seems that like a lot of people when they're giving these, given these abundance of resources to just do anything and everything with, they just completely mishandle them, and the actual foundation of what they're making is very loose and shaky, but they put all this extra stuff on top to make it seem like it's more modern or more professional or, or just better designed, right? And I'm not saying this is always true. Obviously, if you're given more resources, in a lot of cases, it will result in a better end product. Well, everything needs to be perfectly optimized if optimization doesn't really matter that much. But I think it's still an important thing to learn how to, you know, when you're designing anything, or even just in life in general, how to work with what you have and do what you can to, you know, accomplish whatever you need to get, right? And, um, <clears throat> I, I guess I'm just tired of every website having, like, smooth scrolling and pop-ups and all these crazy JavaScript bells and whistles that don't need to be there in the first place. Because, you know, sometimes just having things be simple and easy is just the better decision.